What an episode we have this week. We have the founder of The Soul Supplier, George Sullivan, on The Money Game podcast. At the time, people wanted these shoes and the, the market's grown heavily since. And I knew a lot about how to get them. I was a geek around the web and I was a geek when it comes to trainers. George shares how he built an incredible platform and a huge community of millions across socials. And that's a big thing that people will miss. They've got a great business, but they're not in front of the camera. People connect to people, so you need to be getting out. You can have some mildly positive people, but they'll still shit on your opinions in a subtle way. Trust me, anyone that does something for nine months, whilst you're going at it full time with another job, you start to question yourself. You can have certain things that you need to do to get your job done as a leader, mm. but you shouldn't be walking around with a privilege. What's been uh, your lowest moment in business? The day that they phoned us up and they said that they couldn't agree to the deal. Yeah, I'll say this openly now, I used Why? to hide these names. George, thanks for coming on to The Money Game, bro. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. I think it was, um, we were trying to work out on the elevator, weren't we? About 2016, I think we first, first met. Yeah, we first met at Seven Store in Liverpool when the Soul Supply was just coming about. Was that about like a year old, two years old? Yeah, it was about a year old. Yeah, and we were asked by uh, Foot Asylum, who owns Seven Store, to go up to Liverpool and drop some promo for their new store launch. Kev was there with Wijnaldum. Is that and, right? Yeah, and someone else, but I can't remember who. And yeah, we were promoting the new store. So Sick. that was a wild amount of time ago, man. The journey's right, been... That, that was um, a decent little gig for you to be that early on into business, right? Yeah, I think we we blew up pretty quickly on the socials yeah. across Facebook, Snapchat, and I was the face of the business. I'm not as much the face today that I once was, mm -hmm. but I was behind in front of the camera. And I think that's a big thing that people people miss. They've got a great business, but they're not in front of the camera yeah. and people connect to people. So you need to be getting out there, which is what we did, which is why Seven asked us to do that. And yeah. that was the same for you, right? They wanted your face yeah. in the store. Yeah. That day. Did you know that, did you kind of do that by accident, be a face of the business or did you know that was important? It was a bit more calculated than that, but I didn't want to do it. As and in, I can share people's pain when they don't want to get in front of the camera. Yeah. But, and I, I like to, generally to people I come across confident and I can talk and I can be on camera. That has been practiced and developed. I was very private before and I did not want to get on camera. And when I first got on camera, I was very scared. I was like, I could not be myself. Yeah, yeah I did yeah. not know what to say. I was, I, I felt the presence of the camera. You, you see a huge change if you just look back at a video now from when you first started. Man, we're gonna have to get one and put it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to talk about like what went, what went badly. I think uh, people always learn a lot from that generally, and and so do we. But yeah, yeah some of the first videos were shocking, um, <laughs> and I hope that they're not still live. But if you can find them, <laughs> dig them out. That's fine. I, I might even dig one out in the future. I mean, I was white as a ghost in one of them and we were doing that for a brand and I looked back on that and I was like, oh, how did they ever ask me to come back? Serious. But but you, you get better at these things, especially yeah. when it's important and you know that it's going to get results. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask mm. you that. So if you're so scared to go in front of the camera mm. and I'm sure a lot of people are and obviously not just going in front of the camera, but scared of just things in general, what kind of push you to just do it anyways? It was Dan. So I worked with my best friend. His name's Dan, Dan Simke. He's I felt like there was two of you when I met. Yeah. When we met. In yeah, the, that's in right. Liverpool. So Dan was there on the day when we met at seven. And Dan, I've known for 25 years and I'm like the back of my hand. He's like my brother. And we're school together. We, we went to school together. Yeah, for a okay. brief time. Yeah. But then we didn't go secondary school together. And he said, you've got to get on camera, man. We need your face on camera. I was like, well, slow down, man. I'm not, it's not like that important. But he said, you need to be on camera. You waffle all day. You love to be the center of attention. Get on camera. I was like, Dan, stop gassing me up. I'm going to get on camera. It's fine. And that, that was it. Uh, through a bit of pushing from Dan, yeah. that's what happened. And I saw what he saw. It's like that sometimes. Dan has more of a creative vision sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have to, I can be more business and strategy focused and Dan is more of the creative vision, man. Yeah. Yeah. So is it, So why did Dan think it was you to be on camera and not him? And he is he on camera? Does sometimes. He, does, does he get on? Yeah. But it was just our personality types. Wow. He, it was just the character I was at the time. He thought if you're that character in your social circle, and the way that you handle and talk to people and you're socializing, why can you not bring that energy to wow. the camera? But it's a different matter for, for a lot of people, including myself then, from being that person socially to doing that on camera. 
Yeah. It's like some people can be funny in their social circle, but you ask them to be funny on camera. Yeah. Not that I was yeah, trying to be right. funny on camera, but and watch them fall flat. Mm -hmm. That will not be funny, right? For some people, because it's just so much pressure. It's different. Yeah. So how, how did you make that? Um, how, did you, how did you progress? You started shit. You couldn't be yourself. How did you end up getting decent? Just exposure to it. The more you get into an uncomfortable situation like that, the better you get. You start mm -hmm. watching yourself back as well, which is the hardest thing. Yeah. I still struggle with it to this day. And before we were talking about personal brands, people that put personal brands over their business. And uh, I struggled in the early days to like watch myself back and self review. But the more you do that, the better you get. It's like anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. hundred percent. So then um, moving on from that, how, how do you, well, so you spoke about there, you just said mm. that it's important to obviously not put your personal brand before your business. Yeah, well, a, what's the, what's, is, there, is there a balance? Because I'm sure that being a, having a personal brand helps your business to mm. an extent. But how do you uh, not sway too much to the other side, one way or another? So we're in different games, right? And you're in football, personal brand is a huge thing as well. Yeah. And who you are and how you project yourself to the outside world is very important. I think in business, if you're building a product for people, the product and the people should come first. And then the, the personal brand can come second. It doesn't mean that it's not important, but it means that I've seen businesses fail because the owner was so self-interested and was using all of the business funds for his personal life, which meant that he sacrifices the staff's benefits and his mindset is more on himself than it is on his business growth. Yeah. And I've seen that with a lot of people. I think I know what you mean. Give mm. me an example of how focusing too much on a personal brand would make the business suffer or, or the product suffer. So a lot of people will use a personal brand for like personal wealth to flaunt, right? Let's say that. And let's say that you do that at the expense of your business. Oh, okay, I got you. And let's yeah. say then you can't give your staff a pay rise. You can't give them the right bonuses. Yeah. Your staff will be watching you drive in in a new Lamborghini thinking, <laughs> I'm driving a Corsa. And my guy, my boss is stunting in the Lambo and he hasn't given me a pay rise that's adequate this year. Yeah. And buddy. people are just going to feel undervalued, man. And it's like, so for me, it's always been about looking after my people. I come from like a humble background. We didn't come from a lot. And I, my dad was always like, make sure you look after people and respect them. And I take that into business, man. Mm. I'm not driving a Lambo at the expense of my people. I'm not driving a Lambo, firstly. <laughs> I've had nice cars, I had nice things, but it's not at the expense of the business growth is what I'm saying. So that's first and the personal stuff should come second. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that was a good example to be fair. Yeah. Um, but but for those who don't know, so you're, you're quite, you're, I mean, for anyone, I guess that knows uh, or is into trainers, yeah. you're obviously huge. Yeah. Huge social following as well. But explain a little bit about the Soul Supply, like how, mm. how it started, what what is it, what you guys do? Yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know, I founded the Soul Supplier eight years ago and its mission was to help people find in-demand footwear. So sneakers, like the Nike Sakai's I've got on my feet, like the Jordans, like the Dunks. Um, at the time, people wanted these shoes and the, the market's grown heavily since. And I knew a lot about how to get them. I was buying them and reselling them. And I knew a lot about the web. Just like a little side hustle. A little side hustle. I was working full time in recruitment. Mm. And there's a, a brief story around that, but I started it whilst I was working full time and run it whilst I was working full time for nine months before I left my full time job. But yeah, I started the business, man, because I had the knowledge. Yeah. And it was it was a it was a website to help people find the info that I had. Right. So at the time, was you just like a bit of a trainer geek? Like you love trainers? Bit of a trainer geek. Yeah. You have, I was, to, you have to be a geek to, right. be, to be good at something. Gonna... I was, I was, I was a geek. I was a geek with the web. My dad was always like the internet. Don't miss the internet. Right. He was like, he's had his own, uh, yeah, successes Sorry. and failures, but his failure in his eyes was he missed the mobile phone era. Right. He had a few opportunities to get on the mobile phone era. And my dad said, no, mobile phones will never work. People will not need them like this. And he was pissed when he saw them blow up, but, right? But he believed in the internet. But he he believed in the internet, but he, he thought he was a, it was a little bit out of his depth. And right. he saw that me coming up when I'm like 10, 11, make sure you focus on the internet. Mm. So I was a geek around the web and I was a geek when it comes to trainers. I was spending all my commission 
on on new trainers once a week i'd buy um <laughs> trainers my dad used to be like what the what are you why are you spending all your money that you've worked hard for on trainers yeah i said don't worry i've got a plan i didn't have a plan uh, how, how old are you uh, uh 21 you 22 because i left school at 18 i actually got thrown out at 17 right so i, I right. saw every single guest that comes on this podcast so got through was atrocious at school it was atrocious yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's mad as well like because my parents uh, got me in on a charity place to a private secondary school, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I got thrown out just after my GCSEs because I was like the class clown. Wow. And so I'm their only child and I've let them down. Up until that point, I'd say that I had a bit too much in life. Like, because I was their only child, we weren't wealthy. We're living in a three bedroom house, terraced house. Yeah. My friends were in big mansions at this school. So I'm seeing the wealth around me, but my parents always wanted to give me the best. Private yeah? school, did you say? Private secondary right. school. And I went there on a charity place, which is like, it's helped by a charity. You have to apply for it. Yeah. My parents got accepted. I got accepted. And then I got kicked out. So not only had they gone to all that effort, I had thrown it away as their only child. And that was like, that was a tough, that was a tough moment because I dosed about for four years, five years, probably had 10 jobs from 17 to 24. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just leave jobs. I'd just, I'd just, my, my dad saw me walking along the high street one day. He's like, where, where are you going? You're meant to be starting that new job. First week I had walked out. I always thought I, I could, I, I had a plan, right? And I had no plan. Um, <laughs> Was but, that just kidding yourself? Or you actually believe like? I believed within that I had a plan. That I could do something big. Right. And if I wasn't happy with a job, I would leave it. A lot of the time it was because I was not putting in the effort and I was not doing the right thing for the job. And I thought I, I could do better. I thought there was the next thing for me. Um, a bit deluded. I guess that confidence is kind of what driven me to some yeah. degree, but there was a delusion there at the time. Yeah. It was, it was a dangerous mentality to have, but it did make me try a lot of different things. But looking back now, mm. you seen that as quite a blessing than having that mindset. Yeah, the blessing of like what happened leaving school, blessing of my parents, my, my dad lost his job at that time, 2008 crash. So at the same time I've been thrown out, we had the crash. So it was this really peak moment I look back on, yeah. which made me, my, my motivation, that cemented it. If, I, if, I, if that shit hadn't have happened, I might not have had the motivation and the hunger that I have today to, to do what I've done. Mm -hmm. Because I might have just gone through and carried on in like a kind of... Um, unfocused kind of unhungry way yeah but yeah. at the time when you um when you found a soul supplier mm. was you actually looking for something or did you just stumble across it and think oh, that's a good idea i was i'd started businesses on and off since uh since school i used okay. to sell cds in the school playground <laughs> cds yeah i've never heard that man. before in my life yeah I've heard, I've heard of sweets but i've never heard of, CD, no, heard of cds to, so we used to of what hopefully we're past Music. past the uh passed the case on this because it wasn't, you were not really allowed to do it. We was downloading music off LimeWire and Kazaar oh, Lime and Wire. selling CDs. Kazaar was before LimeWire. So anyone that had uh, LimeWire knew the Kazaar era with the CD burners in the towers. <laughs> that's what we used to use. And I'd be like, when we got our first computer, I was like, make sure we get a CD burner, please, mum. I've got a plan. I always had this plan. Why, right? why, why was you doing that? Why were you selling CDs? Just solely just for, for money? Just for the hustle at school. But for money or just- Money at school, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not money. just for the fact you wanted to just just do something. Because you was all right for money. You, you weren't broke, like, was you? Well, I wasn't given a lot of money compared to people at that school. Oh, okay. Oh, and so you felt like you probably had less than everybody else around Yeah, you. I had a part-time job um, working in a local gym behind a bar. And then I was like, little side hustles were me because my parents couldn't give me a lot of money like some of the kids. Some of the kids would get like a brand new BMW at 17 years old at that so. school. And I didn't have my first car till I was 24. So I just wanted to try and like get myself to some level. It That did create a hunger in me seeing all of that. Yeah. But and that's a good question, you know. In most schools, mm. normal schools, public schools, mm. there's a lot of like entrepreneurial kids that are selling sweets. Were, mm. there, were there any in private school? <laughs> or was you, you know, the, was you the only the, one? The, the private school that I went to, it was a bit more of a rago private school. It wasn't like a top tier private school, put it that way. Yeah. So but there private were, school nonetheless, right? So there's more. There, there were than... more. There were yeah, yeah. But there were more. What would I say? Like, it wasn't like the ultra wealthy yeah, in this yeah. private school. So you had a bit more entrepreneurial spirit. People okay. that were maybe from like 
dads that were like old school geezers or geez that had sent made their money and sent their kids to private school. Right, right. There was a few of them characters, right? So you you'd the the group that I was in with, and like Dan's brother went to this school as well, which was mad. Um, he there was just mad groups of kids that were actually like little shits. Yeah. They were not well behaved and they were not posh kids and they were not they were just into mad stuff, a lot of them. So there was some entrepreneurial yeah. spirit. Yeah. Like, I just struck a question. Yeah. Is a, a question came up in my head. Hmm. Is that people that sell sweets in school, is it solely money driven or is it just the fact of doing something entrepreneurial? I think so it's the you've, fact that you've got it and you want to get that satisfaction from, from doing that. Like for me, it was like, if, if I could do that, I was like, yes, yeah, that's a it, win. It feels good. Yeah. But I mean, like the kids are, that are in um, a private hmm. school, would they have the drive to go and do that because they really they got money? No, a lot of them, and you see this now. You see that some of the some of the kids that I went to school with, they're not necessarily doing a lot that they value personally, and they're still trying to find their place in the world at thirty, and they yeah. don't have the hunger that they wish they had. I've ha I've some of them have openly said like fair play, um, I don't have that level of hunger. I wish I could muster it, but I don't have it. Mm. And this isn't me putting myself on that pedestal oh, of like, yeah, I've yeah. just been lucky to have that hunger. Yeah. They've got other things that I might not have. But I think you, you, you need to create the hunger in your child somewhere. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I have children, it's going to be done from an early age. They're not just getting handouts. How, yeah, how, you know? how, how would you go about that? Just making them well, earn? If you, want, you if you want 20 pound, you better have earned some money first. Right. If you want, yeah, if you want some money from me, you better have done something of value to get the money. Yeah, it's not just like give me twenty pound, Dad. Here you go. 100%. Yeah. So did you stay in touch with a lot of the kids that you went to private school with? A few, a few, but They're I've had to. I've had to limit that circle. <laughs> Why? Because like, I don't like. I di I've never liked the saying of like, you know, the five people that you know are the people that make you, but you do start to know that that becomes true. Mm -hmm. it's even the case of like you can have some mildly positive people like i've got a few from school but they'll still shit on your opinions in a subtle way and what i mean by that is they might credit you to your face they might say nice things and big you up but they'll bring you down in other ways around your opinions and your thoughts and your ambitions and your your thoughts around certain things right if you have like a complex thought or like an idea about something that's different from the mainstream that that can be dangerous as well. So it can be very subtle the people that you're around. This mm. isn't. This doesn't mean you should have yes men around you all the time. You should yeah. have people that can question you, but they should they should question you in like a very upfront way that's clear to you and not just trying to shit on you subtly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that is that something that you really um you really keep in mind even even today? I keep it in mind with work, man. You know when you've had two good weeks around people in the office and you haven't or you know, in your game, right? You with inspiring high performers that have good ideas, you notice, like mm. you notice how you feel when you, we said it before, you walk away from these podcasts when you're speaking to good people, 100%. you're building each other up and you're like, that's power, I need more of that. Yeah. So it's just a case of like, do you want more power in your life? Or have you got an inkling that that might not be giving you it? Well, just focus on the things that, it's yeah. not about cutting out, it's just about focusing more on the, the right things. Mm -hmm. And naturally the things will fall away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, cause it sounds ruthless, uh, I'm cutting you out. It's not like that. It's more like focusing on the things that bring you more positivity. Huge shout out to one of our sponsors, Say It With Diamonds, an amazing jewelry company founded by a friend of mine, Charlotte, who you might have seen previously on this podcast. Say It With Diamonds have brilliant collections for everyone, male and female, and for any age. They launched a men's collection recently. They're also engagement ring specialists, and I can definitely vouch for them here as they did make mine, which was amazing. Visit their website, I'll go over to their Instagram page and have a look. Great quality and very affordable, but they also offer bespoke jewelry, as I mentioned, engagement rings and other diamond gifts. On their website, you'll see a member box that you can purchase for 20 pound for the year, which gives you one year's worth of free next day delivery and 10% off everything over 50 pound. Even better, all the Money Game listeners can get a 15% off everything online using the code MONEY15, all in capitals. Don't play games with your jewelry, get it from somewhere trusted. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. That's something that, to be fair, comes up a lot on like this podcast when they talk about maybe their parents, because mm. it's not like they can't necessarily cut their parents out, mm. but they, they know and they mindfully spend less time speaking to their parents because they, maybe they might be quite negative or they might like you yeah. say shit on their ideas. Um, there's one guest in particular I remember saying it to, he was talking about um, 
buying this really nice place and doing it up. And it was a bit of a challenge project. And she was just like, why? Why do you always have to like do things the hard way? Why you always got to challenge yourself? Just like enjoy it type thing. And he was just like, he put the phone down. I was like, I just can't, can't speak to you. Yeah. Um, oh, so the parent was saying, why do you always have to do yeah, it? Like, why oh, you always, okay, why yeah. Why you always yeah, got yeah. to do hard things? Why you always got to like, just you've made good money, just relax let, now type thing. Let me tell you about what my dad said to me when we got, I shared this on my Instagram story. When we got our fourth office, so we had grown in the first two years, we had grown massively, right? And we expanded our team. We, we outgrew three offices in two years and our fourth office, we wanted to spend like a fair few hundred thousand pounds on mm -hmm. refurbishing it and we were gonna buy it. And my dad was just like, that's a wild idea. Do not do that. And then me and Dan are like, this is a great idea. We're gonna make it the cultural hub for the sole supplier. People are gonna be attracted here. It's in Woolwich in Southeast London. And if you know Woolwich, <laughs> you know why it needs to be a really sick office. Cause if people are going to go to Woolwich, it better be a good office. Yeah. And my, but if I had listened to my dad in that moment, I may not, we may not have been where we are today. Cause after we signed that office and refurbished it within three months, we had the best growth that we had ever had really? over a year and a half period. And we outgrew that office a year sooner than expected. Mm -hmm. And at that point, me and my dad's relationship improved because we were like, he was like, I have to drop some of my assumptions because you're proving things to me, just because my experience was this way, yeah. it doesn't mean it's gonna be like that for you. And we've got a great relationship now. He's, I speak about him a lot because he's inspired me in ways that he doesn't know, but I've also done a lot that goes against stuff he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's, well, even that, respect to him, because he even admitted it, right? Oh yeah, he's very lot, humble lot like that. Too, too, too stubborn to even admit it. Mm. Yeah, so no, that's, that's interesting. So, um, so a question I had, when, when you when you stumbled across the idea of a sole supplier, mm. was it, wow, well, million pound idea type thing? Or was it, oh, that's, that's a cool hobby. Let me see how it goes. Yeah, so, so at the time I had ambition. I have a lot more ambition now. Yeah. I thought I was very ambitious then. And then I thought I was very ambitious a year later, even more so. So I've explained it before, it's like steps of ambition. And I think what can happen is some people get carried away in the early stages of their idea, which means that they start doing things way too soon, or they might take investment money, which we haven't done until this date. We've been self-invested mm -hmm. and profitable, but some people get well ahead of themselves, which can work, yeah. but it can also mean your idea runs away from you and you stop focusing on the things you need to do now that make okay. you important today, that make it successful today. So yeah, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like this is going to be a five, 10 million pound idea at the start. It was just like, how can we help people with all of these cool releases that are getting out? How can we generate Twitter followers? How can we rank in Google? Mm -hmm. That was it. I was just looking for that number one Google ranking. Yeah. It's like, how do I get number one? I want to be number one. From the beginning? From the beginning, I knew about SEO. I worked in an SEO agency for my second job. I was selling SEO services when I was like 18, 19. Mm -hmm. I was like, I need to be number one with the sole supplier. That's my goal. And we got there after like 10 months, nine, 10 months. Yeah. But it's happened in what? So that was for uh, one of the biggest shoes of the year, the triple black Harachi. Did okay. you used to buy? Bro, Harachi's yeah? my favorite. <laughs> you know, they're still my favorite as well to some extent. So, yeah, I still so. wear them, man. And uh, it was the triple black Harachi. And we got number one from it. And we like had tens of thousands of views on the site in a day. And we generated a few thousand in that day. And that was the validation I needed because yeah. for nine months before that building, we were not getting anywhere. And I was like, I need to quit this soon, man, because I'm working hard at work. I'm, I hadn't been having a drink as well. I was sober for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. All these sacrifices, like, and- well, Just because you was- Focus yeah, on the business, I, you're like, I'm not drinking. Because I wanted to be at it full time. Like okay. I needed to make my money at work and I needed to build the business. So I needed, and I've said this before, it's very important. I needed time, I needed money, and I needed to be able to think. Yeah. And they're all interlinked for me. So it was like stopping alcohol and drinking created more time, gave me more energy to think and created more money. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah like and that. it's just such a simple thing that people can do. Yeah. And I do it from time to time now, but in those early days, if I hadn't have done it, the soul supply might not have been where it is today again, because mm -hmm. I might not have had the time. I might not have had the energy. 
after a hard day in recruitment, you don't want to come home if you've been on the booze at the weekend yeah, exactly. and work on your passion. Mm. It's like you doing this, man. You're you're doing all of the training that you do and you do this. Mm. You got to have good energy to do that. And that yeah, requires yeah. you putting your life into order. Food, gym, looking after yourself, sleep. Yeah. And not yeah, yeah. boozing a lot is the point. Yeah. So yeah. How, how did you get started? So you had the idea, you and Dan. Yeah. Straight away. Did you so just wasn't, call up Dan and be like, I've got an idea? No. So me and Dan started working together a year and a half after. But oh, right, okay. first thing first, I would just, I would set up the site uh, within about two weeks. I had 10 grand stacked from recruitment and reselling. And it cost about 400 pounds to set up the website. Mm. The best ideas are like low risk, low cost. Yeah. But they are rare. And we were a bit early as well. So it took two years before that trainer market actually popped off. But we were early, luckily, and we had some results which kept us going. But you can be very early with an idea and stop doing it because the market's not there. Mm -hmm. but yeah, low cost, low risk was the point. And I just set the site up over a two week period, like trying it myself. Yeah. And then I hired a freelance developer. And then we hired a before freelance. Before you made money? Uh, before we made money. I used out, that, out of your 10K? I used that 10K stack that I got from, from recruitment and uh, eBay sales to invest in the freelancers whilst I was working. By the way, how, how when you started as well, and yeah. how, how did it actually make money? So for anyone unfamiliar, we generate 90% of our revenue from affiliate marketing programs. That is where you get paid a commission of the sale from the retailer. So we're Nike's biggest partner in Europe. Really? Um, we're the second biggest content affiliate, money saving experts first. So affiliate is a massive business, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, we, we drive these retailers 60 million in revenue a year through affiliate schemes, yeah? So we've built that up over the last eight years. But affiliates massive, Amazon that created turn, turn it. Turnover, right? Yeah, we generate them 60 million in revenue and then we get a cut, right? So we get anywhere from 10 to 15%, let's say. Mm. But Amazon created affiliate in the 2000s, early 2000s. Amazon were the creator because Amazon wanted to get everyone promoting their products and their bookstore. So Amazon created the affiliate model and that's what we use today. You can sign up digitally online. Every, loads of businesses have them. It's crazy, you type in like Tesco's affiliate, you type in like, you know, I was gonna say PC World, is it still about? <laughs> okay, no, 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 curries, say curries. Curries, yeah? Curries affiliate and you can see that they've all got a, pro a program, yeah. That's mad. Mm. And that's, that's the, that, you had the idea of how to make money through affiliate schemes from the beginning. That's, I, that's how you knew he was going to make money. I knew about affiliate schemes, but I couldn't actually get accepted onto the affiliate programs until six months of running the business because they want to see that you're a good content business. They want to see that you've actually got credibility yeah. in your area before they accept you. They don't accept anyone onto the program. You have to be doing something of value. Yeah. Mm. So then how, how long did it take you before you got that? Six months until okay. we got... Like Nike affiliate program, which is now one of our biggest affiliates, was not a thing then. JD Sports was one of the biggest ones at the time. And uh, I just wanted to get on the JD Sports program. I was like, that's how we can start making money. But I run it for six to nine months without really making any money. Yeah. So yeah. How, would it, how would it work? So you'd make this website, you talk about it, build a bit of a community, and then you just have a link from them and they buy through your link. Yeah, exactly. So the, the customer doesn't pay any more. We just get a commission from the retailer of the sale. So that's the retailer's way of saying, thank you for sending us that traffic and that sale. Yeah. And yeah, we just use tracked links. Yeah. Mm. And then at what point did you start really like attracting, um, like not having Nike start knowing about you? Yeah. So you sign up on these affiliate programs and then what happens is you start to get recognized because they'll look at the stats in a dashboard and they'll be like, who's this sole supplier that's coming up? Like, mm. how are they driving so many orders? And it's wow. funny because if you work in this game, some of these retailers are suspicious. They're like, how are they driving all these sales? <laughs> and then we, you, you, you present to them and they're like, oh, brilliant. And then later on down the line, now eight years, we're in like a, a long-term partnership with Nike, which I can't say too much about, but we're one of their biggest partners. And, and now we deal with them directly. So it's like, it takes years of proving yourself to build up these relationships. Yeah, We've had times, Kev, where we've like, we've had to, we've had times with retailers where they've hustled us and they've squeezed us, where we've had to walk away mm. and lose a lot of money and lose a lot of products from them because it's a partnership, this affiliate game. 
we're gi we're giving them traffic they're giving us commission we're giving them you know we're promoting yeah. their products but it can be a, it can be a tough partnership sometimes yeah it's it's weird though right because like someone like nike yeah why would they need someone else driving traffic like all these mm. people should know about them already type mm. thing do you know what i mean mm. so what what how, how do you think that that works yeah it used to be um it you that used to be an objection we used to handle all right but yeah, the, I get, but yeah. the point is that we are driving a new audience for them so whilst they've got a whole host of marketing efforts as a retailer they've got a marketing strategy they've got a budget and they've got individuals doing things in marketing we've got i would say a crack team of marketers that no footwear inside out. Really? Yeah. So our staff retention is very good. We've kept people in the business for a long time and they're skilled up and they know what the audience like. That's our USP. So that's why Nike and JD and these other brands like us because our team and our technology has something that they don't have. It's like this breadth of experience that means we can give them new customers. Right. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that influence. They're looking for that something to get their customer over the line to sway them over right to sway yeah, them yeah, over because yeah, yeah. when nike say this is the new harachi this is the best shoe ever people are like you're nike you're gonna say that yeah yeah but if uh, soul supplier they know are unbiased say it then they listen right and genuinely like you ha this has to be clear we do not promote shit that we would not give to our audience mm -hmm. i'm about to ask you that yeah that's so important never sell your soul in life or as an affiliate yeah because people know, the audience know. Yeah, You've got to keep it authentic. So we've had to turn down a lot of money from people where they ask, can you, be my next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you promote this product? Or can you, we've got 50 grand for a campaign. It doesn't work on site, I'm afraid. We can't promote it mm. because our audience won't react. We say that for their benefit as well. Like yeah. the last thing we want is a bad rep that Soul Supplier took 50 grand from a retailer or a brand and it, it fell to bits and the audience just didn't like it. It's like, mm. it's, a, it's a bad image all round. Yeah. What does it say to our staff as well? They're like, what, you're just taking that on for money. Again, it's like, mm -hmm. doesn't feel right. Mm. Yeah. So you said for the first nine months, mm. you, you didn't really um, make any money. You wasn't really moving anywhere. Yeah. What was, what was the catapult moment? What was the moment that kind of- Tri Triple Black Karachi. Oh, it, that was, was it was that day. It was that day as well when my family actually believed that I made money legitimately. <laughs> yeah they were like oh you've got a real business okay yeah i was like look at this this is real and they actually took time after that because i'd say to them look we've actually earned good money this day the audience like it they're like yeah i still don't believe you you know you've always been a bit of a class clown yeah. like what are you up to sort of thing i'm like this is so yeah, yeah that was it the triple but one how, how though um we got number one for the triple black karachi in google Bro, if I pulled out my phone now, it's number two still to this day. Yeah, yeah. So we got number one for the triple black, which was the biggest shoe of the winter. And then we got number one six months later for the triple white Harachi. Because once you get your first ranking for something, Google, you know, they yeah. attach the but relevancy. How do, you, how, how do you even go about that? Is that, is that very detailed? It's quite detailed. Camera uh, not quite, but at the time it was a lot easier. Google's a lot more complex now. Right. You can't really rig the Google system is the point. You've got to work in the most authentic way. So with yeah. Google, just remember this. They work on experience, authenticity, and trust. Experience, authority, and trust. It's their EAT algorithm. EAT is what it's called. So when you're creating content, all you've got to think about is, is this content best for our user? Mm. Will our audience love it? What questions do they have? Answer all of those questions in your content, and Google will love it. Because yeah. Google now thinks like a human being. It mm. didn't used to eight years ago. You used to just be able to like get certain keywords in, yeah. use certain images, get some social proof from Twitter, and then you'd start ranking. You wouldn't rank what first, but you'd rank. And now it's it's like, it's just for the best for the user. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you have much competition at the time? Uh, not at the time. The drop date was about and still is about at the time. I say it straight. My mission was to take what I'd seen from some of the blogs out there and improve on it. Mm. I was like, I can do a better job than these guys. Like they're not putting up information that I know. I was like, they're not putting up some of the shoes that I like. Yeah. Why? They're missing out on these things. Yeah. So I just designed the site to like do, do a better job, a bigger and better job. Mm. Yeah. And then after that, so you hit the Harachis came out, blew from there, right? Yeah. And what was the strategy from there? 
How did you how did you like build on that momentum? Man, the traffic was doubling like every six months at this point. It was yeah. mental. And then more shoes were ranking number one. You know, like all of the Harachis that we put up would then be able to rank first. Then it would be Air Forces. And then it's like, we could just start getting number one rankings better. Mm. Competition was less. We hired a few more content creators and an SEO person. Dan was working at it. We was working all sorts of hours to make it successful. And there's a big gap from then to now, obviously, because that's like a six year period. Yeah. But the focus never really changed. It was like, how do we show people all of the best products and how do we help them get them from all of the retailers? And that's what it's been. And you know, like the sneaker industry grew like 5X from then till now. And it's scheduled to grow another 5X from now till 2030. Yeah. So it's like, you heard that book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, where they say that there's other factors that are responsible in your success. And actually it's not hard work and it's not the idea. It's just to do with timing which is a bit of a shitty prospect if you're working hard and you want to attribute that to your hard work. It's like, keep thinking that your hard work is what done it because that's good for your mind. Mm. But the thing I take from that is we were just before the big boom of the sneaker market. So all of that hard work and the idea and the striving for it to be a good product coupled with the timing of the market helped. But yeah. I say, if anyone's read that book, don't take it, with, take it with a pinch of salt yeah. because you want to self reinforce you want to believe that your hard work and your ideas what got you there, not but, just some external factor yeah. like timing. But then, even if it was timing, yeah, without the hard work, the timing doesn't matter. Exactly. Anyways. So the hard, the hard, exactly. hard work is the predominant factor, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Nice. So um, there's also yeah. So obviously a, a lot gone into um, building it from from then to now. Mm. Has there been any more catapult moments that have taken you to another level from then? <sighs> there's been some wicked failures, man. Yeah, we'll go, we'll I, was, I was documenting a few of them before, which catapulted yeah. us after the learnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but one big catapult moment that I like to use, it's, like, it's another one that was, uh, it was high risk, low cost, this change. It doubled the traffic in like a month, this, right? Our URL structure on our website was messed up. And me and Dan had had this suspicion for a long time that it was messed up. And I was like, if we change the URLs, we're changing thousands of pages URLs. This could be catastrophic. Mm. So super high risk. But after analyzing it, we decide, okay, we're going to take this dive. I think this, co like I say low cost. This probably cost like two grand to get done. And were you all good at this moment? You we was all to, good. You just wanted to just we were all good, more. but we're always looking at opportunities. What yeah. can we go after? What's like a low effort, but maximum benefit for mm. the audience? We're like, there's so many pages that are being missed by people. And we was like, right, if we can just do this, we interviewed a few different agencies. Can you do this URL restructure? Some of them didn't fill us with confidence. Anyway, we did it. Traffic doubled within a month or two months. It initially bubbled, bubbled a bit lower and then it, it doubled, man. And we were like blown away by that. So that was a catapult moment. Yeah. We were probably on like, um, probably like 800,000 visitors a month at this point, five years ago. And it doubled to like a million and a half in a month and a half. <laughs> It was wild, man. The, yeah. But that also caused a lot of problems because we had to scale up our team at yeah, that yeah, point. Yeah. And then I'm like an organic uh, biz CEO, right? I haven't had like formal training in it. So scaling at that point and knowing how to handle that many people all at once, it was tough. Um, and that caused a lot of problems and future slowdown. Yeah. yeah. When you was weighing that up, mm. What were the risks of, of doing that? What was the, the, risk the worst is that, case scenario? Well, that site could really fall flat. Like we could lose exactly. a lot of traffic. Yeah, People rebuild their sites and make mistakes with the URLs and they lose hella traffic. Mm. People launch in the US and they have problems with their URLs and their site and they lose a lot of traffic. So it's a big danger area. There's a lot more knowledge on it now, but it's, it's a dangerous thing. Yeah. yeah. But when you started, did you did you know there was a lot of demand for what you was you was doing? Um, did you have doubts about that? Do people, I did have doubts. You think do people even really want to know this? Yeah, but from reading different things, man, you start to realize like create something that you know is great for you and your close people. Mm. If it's a low cost idea, like it was at the time, I could set the website up and really test the market. 
But that's yeah. why that nine month period was pivotal because actually I wasn't getting the response I wanted as much. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get stuff to rank. So I started to doubt, is there a market for this? Yeah. Trust me, anyone that does something for nine months, whilst you're going at it full time with another job, you start to question yourself. Yeah. I, was, I was 23 or 23 at the time. I was an amateur man in my head. Mm. I was the, the man I am today compared to the boy I was then. Like it's crazy the, looking back at it. Bro, the comparison of like the way I used to think at 23, the confidence levels you have around things. Like I see some 23 year olds now and they're firing, man. I'm like, I wish I was like you mm. at 23, but I wasn't like that. So it's like, yeah, tricky times. Yeah, talk, talk to me about that, that um, transfer period between working in recruitment and mm. trying to get the business off the ground at the same time. What yeah. did your days look like? How did you go about it? How did you balance it? So this is why I said those three things about time, money, yeah. and being able to think because I was hitting my targets in recruitment and that meant that I could do some stuff at lunch and my bosses, Ben and Jim, Ben's my best pal still to this day. He's one of the only people that I liked working for out of those 10 jobs. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, slightly disrespectful because some of the work was flowing into their day, but I was able to get away with it to some degree. Mm -hmm. I was hitting my targets, I was allowed. So I could do that at lunch and then in the evening I'd come home and I'd just sit at my computer and work on it. Mm. Um, I'd make sure I go to the gym three times a week or, or do a run. I wasn't training heavily like I am now because you can't train heavily if you've only got limited time. Yeah. You know, like you can't do it all. You heard that thing, you've only got two time for two and a half things mm. in your life. So what's the, what's the other half? Some people it might be like their missus or their partner. Yeah. It's like, don't make her the half. She doesn't, she doesn't want to know she's the half thing that you can only do. So you've only got time for two and a half things, right? Is the point. So I just had to cut back on a lot, man. Mm. Otherwise, and the boozing was one of them. A year and a half off the boots. Yeah. It was, for, throughout that as well and throughout mm. um, growing the business, did you have other distractions that tried to come in? Maybe like another idea, another venture that you have to kind of battle away? There was distractions. There were some things going on in my personal life at the time. Um... Yeah, the lady I was with at the time, it was it was tough. My family mm. was going through all sorts of financial trouble, which was tough. Thankfully, now we're in a good position. My mum and dad work for the business nice. and I'm with this great woman that I love to bits. Yeah. But it wasn't like that then. And that was tough. You've always got, everyone's got shit going on. Mm. And I don't think that's an excuse not to be able to get at it and work. You just it's have to- More of to, a reason, right? Yeah, and yeah. That's a good way to look at it, man. Like- if you've got reasons to be responsible, that can make you motivated. Yeah. But, but, but you have to tell people in your life. So like using the partner example, if you've got a partner that's holding you back, have the conversation with, with her or him like, and say, you know, I'm going after this. What can we do to improve our life? So you're happy and I'm happy and I can do what I need to do to go after it. Because yeah. I see so many people who are held back in that scenario. But you just have to put, put, get your ducks in line and speak to people. So they know what you're doing. I told everyone at the time, you're not going to see me. I'm going to be working each night. Mm. I'm not going out drinking. It's nothing against you. Yeah. But I'm doing this for me. And trust me, the true one stuck around. I've still got a lot of them pals today. Yeah. During that time, did you feel, did it feel like quite a lonely journey? And it's hard because you question if people are going to be there. Mm. You question if, you're, if your closest pals are still going to stick around. And then you start to realize that if they don't, then it's not worth it anyway. They they yeah, yeah, they yeah. didn't value you being successful anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's it doesn't mean that they're they're not relevant or you shouldn't have them around, but they're less relevant because they're not so. supported. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I was I was lucky in that regard. Yeah. People have been good to me. So did you have did you have much of a social life at all? I did, man. I was a party animal for a bit when I was younger. Even throughout the business. Not throughout the business. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Um, for that period of time, no, yeah. I wasn't socializing. I wasn't going on how, holiday. How I wasn't even buying trainers or clothing. That must have been tough for you, right? Yeah, <laughs> all I was doing was buying shoes to resell. That was yeah. it. But I didn't have much of a social life then. This is the curve that we say. It's kind of like this. It's like um, hard work, hard work, hard work. Okay, it's working, working. Payback, payback, celebration. Oh no, we need to work hard again, work hard again. You know, payback. It's kind of like the graph of success and payback. Right. I mean, some people just go like this and never stop. Some people, it goes like this. But generally what people do is, and what I've experienced is 
there's periods of super hard work where you're at it for a long period of time. And then you have a period where you're like, yes, we've got to that level that we wanted to. And then you, you don't sit back, but you take it all in and you yeah. appreciate. You're like, yes, we've done it. Mm -hmm. We've done what we set out to do. And then you go again. It doesn't mean you have to go and, you know, piss all your money away yeah. or, you know, abuse your body. So you're feeling awful. Keep the same habits, but have that period of looking back where you're grateful, where you can think, yes, we've done it as a team. Yeah. Do you, do you feel the need to celebrate wins much? I mean, like there's this theory of don't celebrate the wins too much and don't get too invested when you're feeling low. Yeah. Keep it balanced. But there's nothing wrong. It's not so much celebrating. It's more like being grateful for where you've come. Yeah. In, it, 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 bringing that gratefulness into your life every, every week, if you can. Mm -hmm. What if we, we, we do it in Slack. For anyone that's used Slack or Teams, we share wins across the company. Mm. We also share what hasn't worked, but we big people up in the company. This has worked well this week. How good's this? We hit this, yeah. we hit that. So you're cultivating this culture of of success and gratitude around it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I think is very important because it's yeah. easy to miss. Yeah, well, that, that's a good topic, culture. Mm. And so that's something that you think about quite a lot. Yeah, it's very being important. Obviously, being, being the boss, you've got to um, make sure the culture is good. How, how do you go about doing that? I really hope you're enjoying the show. I would just like to ask for one minute of your time to tell you about my sponsor who support makes the show possible, CPC Finance. CPC Finance is a finance broker that specialises in sourcing and packaging a wide range of property funding. You name it, from buy to lets to commercial properties, auction investments, property developments. They are everything you'd want as a finance broker working for you on your property deal. They're extremely experienced. They know their market extremely well, which means they can move quickly. They're on the ball. They've been in the game for 30 years, which has enabled them to, one, build very strong relationships with a variety of lenders, which as an investor is super important, especially when things don't go to plan. Deals in certain situations aren't straightforward, which is often the case. They are bespoke specialists. And two, they have a brilliant understanding of all types of property investing. They know the strategies, they understand deal structures. There isn't anything these guys haven't seen, you know, they're seasoned pros. So if you're someone looking for property finance of any kind, go to cpcfinance.co.uk and on the homepage, you can schedule in a call at whatever time or day suits. 10 jobs that I had from 17 to 24, eight or nine of them, I hated the bosses that I worked for. Mm. Two of them, I worked at the Yellow Pages at one job, right? So it used to be called Yellow Pages, it's now called Yell. I was knocking on doors around the city. I was knocking on kebab shop doors, right? This was the toughest thing I've had to do, trying to sell websites to kebab shop owners, not just <laughs> kebab shop owners, but... <laughs> Generally, like I was walking up and down high streets like Islington, high, what's it called? Something Islington, the main street, high, not Highbury in Islington, Upper Street right. in Islington. I'm walking up and down there, knocking on all the doors of the shops. But James Bugner, his dad was a boxer. He inspired me, man. He, he was a great leader. But a lot of them were horrendous. Mm. Yeah. So... Only a few of them did I... What was the original question you asked there? About keeping culture. So About I'm, I'm keeping culture, saying, yes. Yeah, you knew what boss not to be, right? Exactly, bad ones. right? So all those people that I didn't like, I took things from and I was like, when I build the soul supplier, we are never running a company yeah, like yeah. that. I want to build a place I like to come into where people are looked after. And also my mum and dad, like my mum, very empathetic and kind, taught me, look after people, treat them mm -hmm. well. You know, they're going to they're gonna look after you. Don't be a, a, a doormat. But yeah. look after people and respect them. And I think that you've got to understand when people are taking the piss out of you. But when someone's looking after you and doing well, give everything back to them, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there any like other things that you do? So there you mentioned about on Slack about everyone talking about the wins and you give people a platform to talk about the wins that they've had in the company. Mm. Is there anything else that you think is important? Most important thing with people when you're a leader. Firstly, as a leader or CEO, you don't have privilege. You can have certain things that you need to do to get your job done as a leader, mm. but you shouldn't be walking around with a privilege. And it comes back to that Lamborghini argument again. Yeah. You shouldn't be the only one that's earning crazy amounts of money in that company. Mm -hmm. If it is, there's a problem. So for me, building a good culture is making sure that you are part of the people that are in your company. Yeah. And for me, that's like getting on a level with them, being the person at socials that talks to everyone and gets to know them. That's approachable. If your team are bringing you problems from their personal life, that's a good sign. 
because you're an approachable leader. Mm. But the three things for culture, um, there's finances. People want to be paid well. They want to learn well. They want good opportunities. Like learning and opportunity go hand in hand. And finally, they want to work with good people. If you can nail all three of those things, then people will stay at your company. Yeah. If they if they like the people that they work with, but they're not getting paid, they're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If they love their job and they like the people they work with, they're getting paid well, but they're not getting opportunities to learn and grow. An ambitious person will leave your company. Mm -hmm. So it's the pillar again of those three things. I yeah. swear I've got multiple different triangles of things, <laughs> right? but that's the three for that. And that's culture in the middle. Yeah. yeah. How's the uh, the hiring process gone for you? Um, it's been tough. A lot, a lot of people say that's like the toughest thing to do. Biggest learning, yeah. Biggest thing I say is we've now got good processes in place for hiring and letting people go. Mm. And that means that all of your team know where they stand. They understand things. They're not surprised, you know. And for hiring, that is, yeah, that's just... You need skin in the game. You need years in the game. You need to have hired a lot of people. You need yeah. to have interviewed a lot of people and you'll work out what works for you. What I'm hiring for might be different to what the other person's hiring for. Mm. We're looking at the start for like the values and the way people are. Integrity is my number one. If someone's got good integrity, which means they respect themselves, other people, they're ambitious. It's kind of like all part of integrity for me. So we're always assessing at the start, is this a good, honest person? Because the rest of it, if you're a good, honest person, you're open to learning, you're open to feedback, you're good with your colleagues. It's everything, man. Everyone should be assessing for that honesty mm. and that openness, I think. Yeah. yeah. Have you had much experience of hiring the wrong person and just like bringing the culture down? 100%. If you've got a good team, and there's a bad egg, the good team will notice it and they will quickly uh, cause trouble. Yeah. Um, it's your duty as a leader to find those people. It's a very difficult thing because our egos can get in the way. It's like, no, 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 I, I hired that person, so they're staying mm. because I hired them. You don't want to admit that. You, yeah, you've you got, you got to let go of that. I've seen people do that. Some, some of our people that are still in the company today, they've been there a long time. We've had to make those tough decisions. Yeah. It's horrible. Like yeah. I remember the first time I had to do that was was tough, very tough. Yeah, easier for you now. It's 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 easier because you understand why you have to do these things. Yeah. And if you give people the right amount of notice and coaching, then it it makes sense. The point is, there's an element of you could be hurting someone's life and finances, which could affect their family and friends. Mm -hmm. And that always weighs on, on your mind. But if you've given them enough chances and coaching and you've been upfront with them and you've said, if this doesn't improve, it can go this way, yeah. then it, it's not a surprise and they understand. Most important mm. because people deserve the chance. They deserve to be coached. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, if someone's not performing and they're not getting further, it's better for them if you let them go or you have a conversation with them because they might be able to do better elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, mm. 100%. So, so moving away from that, talking about um, building a community. So you guys have built like a massive community, right? Yeah. How, how, how are you going about doing that? That was pivotal in the early stages. So me getting on the camera along with the community yeah. tied everything together. It was like, what oh, was your main platform that you started out on? Um, we had Facebook okay. groups. Okay. So we got just under 100,000 members in the two Facebook groups. People are still in Facebook, right? I thought it was just like for older people, but people are still on Facebook groups talking about trainers and buying and selling. So we started the soul market, which is our marketplace off the back of one of our Facebook groups, but that's community. Like, you know, we go and meet people on the street. We know people at events, like the community in the sneaker game is big. Mm. Yeah. Everyone's comparing what kicks they've got on, what yeah. outfits they're wearing and people know each other. Yeah. So it was very hard to get into the community at first. Right. The OGs of the community hated on me. Man. <laughs> I'm going to do a podcast on Sunday and this is with like a, a, a shop in a, like a, a crep, it's called the Crep Collection Club. Right. All right. Great shop. And this podcast is run by what I'd consider one of the OGs. Yeah. This is not one of the OGs that hated on me. Right. But I would never have been asked to do something like that in the early days because the OGs are very protective of the sneaker industry. I'm now one of the OGs in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I've got skin in the game. I've been in this industry 10 years. I didn't know it was, it was aesthetical. 
Well, it's like it's like That's a lot like, of industries. The OGs, yeah. like you know, like rock music, for instance. Mm -hmm. When new artists get into the game, new bands, the OGs are always skeptical. Who are these people? Yeah. I don't like their new style. Like the rap game as well. Mm -hmm. Some of the new rappers, right? People are like, what the? Why is he rapping like that? Yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah. crazy. So, like, how did you like earn your stripes then? How'd you do that for? You earn your stripes by being consistent, authentic, and. Yeah people start to see you're getting liked and results. Mm. Well, as soon as people see the community reacting, as soon as they see, oh, people like George from The Soul Supplier and he knows his stuff. Mm. I'm still wearing trainers to this day. Like, I'm wearing trainers all day, every day. Yeah, I like to wear trainers. I don't buy the latest high heat every week. I wear a lot of Air Forces and I'm, I'm still embedded in the culture. And yeah, I always yeah. was. So you got to earn your stripes by being authentic. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, so and, and being and being good to the OGs as well. Yeah. Can't just come into the game, any any industry, and being like, hey man, I run this game now. Yeah. yeah. Which you see some rappers, new rappers do. And mm. they like, they like, they like shit on the early era of like hip hop and stuff. Yeah. And it's much harder. So that's controversial. But my way was just pay respect to people, ask them things because they know a lot. Yeah. And and just keep doing what you're doing. Be authentic. So like sometimes sometimes the OGs abuse their powers man uh, that's exactly what it was so how would yeah. you have felt and what, how well, would you... i couldn't get into certain events we would not be invited to certain things we wouldn't get information we would be put on different commission rates yeah there would openly be people saying things about us in the industry to hurt the soul supplier reputation of mm. mine it was it was hard work i've yeah. had arguments with people where i've been put called out for things Serious. By people trying to make me look bad and the business look bad yeah. to try and hire our rep to stop us growing. Mm. People didn't want people to know about footwear. Soul Supplier's job is to help millions a month find footwear, right? At the time, it wasn't millions. Yeah. But then it was like, how many people can we help? The OGs are like, stop telling people about footwear. Mm. We want to know all of it, not new people. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, it's similar, it's like, that. It's like it's similar in football, you know, Is sometimes it? like when the young kids back in the day, bro, when the young kids would come up to train with the first team, yeah. I swear, bro, these first team players did not want the kids to succeed. Bro. And they don't help them. No, the opposite. What they just tell them mad bro, stuff. They were like, no, they would like, they would what? try and cripple them so they just couldn't play. What, like, as if in they, if actually they, they, physically hurt them? No, 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 no. Or just... Like if they, if they miss or they didn't pass, okay. they'd be like, hey, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like 16 year old kid, yeah, like 17 year old kid. Yeah, like, the, yeah, yeah, try and break them. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. try and break them. That's what I said when the OGs try to abuse their power sometimes. Because I remember I used to go, go up to the first team. Yeah. And then it would, it would be like everyone just so respectful. Like they could talk to someone like shit mm. and expect them just because they're more senior to just take it. Mm. But I never used to be like that. Mm. I used to so always be used like, to bro, I'm a person before I'm a footballer. Yes. Like I understand like if you're talking, if you're talking football, I would listen 100%. Mm. But if you try and take it further and just like disrespect me as a person, mm. then I don't really care who, who, how many games you played or do you know what I mean? Mm. But that's that's the culture in football. I, I think it's changed a little bit now. It's a little bit softer. I was going to ask that. Yeah, but back in the day it was, bro. The world has got a bit softer, right? The world right? has got softer, yeah. And so you can't be doing that. But there's something to be said about trying to break people in that way, Yeah, which can have good effects for some people, right? Mm. Some people flourish in that, in that kind of pressure. Yeah. But some people yeah. fuck, like they'll I leave. I think it's the intention though. So, as a, uh, yeah. so like if a young kid came up now, mm. there would be certain challenges you'd throw at them that I would try and throw at them to try and test them, to improve them, mm. to be like, okay, so I can take a strong one on. Like for example, if you came into the um, into the game with the OGs, there could be there could have been an OG in there. Mm. That'd be like, I literally, no matter what, don't want you coming in here. I don't want no one new, no matter how good you are. So I'm going to try and break you so you just vanish. Yeah. But it, if they try and break you so then they can... See how strong you are. Like, okay, cool. That's a different matter. You can take him. Let's take it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that you mentioned like the gatekeeping there is the yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. It's gatekeeping. And you've experienced it in football. Mm. I know people that experience it in music now. Yeah. And I know people in the sneaker industry. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I you see it. You see it in music all the time, right? The same drum and bass artists are on the flyer 20 years later. <laughs> There's a few new ones, the same house artists. House is a bit better, but I'm yeah. banging to my music, man. I mix, I got turntables at home, love drum and bass, love house. But you see that same thing, gatekeeping. Mm. It's funny that it's prolific across all different industries, yeah, same way. Sneakers, yeah. Bro, like, yeah, yeah. It's nuts. Um, question I had for you though, mm. can train, I actually spoke about, to another player about this. Mm. Can trainers make good investments? Absolutely. Talking Good investments are happening every day with trainers. I was just doing, I did a video, um, watch the Soul Supplier TikTok because I'm going to be on there 
10 times a week. We're doing 10 videos a week on the TikTok, so, right? So fresh. But, Have you started or? Um, we doing, we're doing TikTok, but Lux Collective, Ben from Lux Collective, man. If you want a good interview, have him on this podcast. This guy is 23, maybe 22 years old. He's getting tens of millions of views across TikTok. His business, luxury uh, bags and luxury products, reselling and selling products, amazing. He, he's come to me and he said, George, you need to get on TikTok because right now it's a faceless TikTok. Be on TikTok. <laughs> Not quite like that. But he said, listen, man, you taught me loads when I was on the come up. And yeah. now I'm telling you, get on TikTok. Yeah. Um, so yeah, TikTok. I just did a video on the, uh, the Nike Dunk, which was, I was talking about the reselling prices in that. And, and it went out today, actually. Uh, some of the Dunks that have released over the last six months, two of them, one of them's reselling for £1,700. It retailed at 160, and the other one, the cactus flea market, cactus plant flea market dunks, selling for like three and a half grand. Mm. Yeah, some of the dunks. There's a huge. There's probably like ten dunks right now that are selling for over a grand. And this is literally just because numbers, right? There's not because they're because they're limited and the demand is there. It's that classic supply and demand. People just want the dunks, and there's always people that want to pay the money for them because they want them now, today. They've yeah. seen them somewhere. They might have seen them on Insta, Soul Supplier. Where is it? Give me it. I need yeah. the shoe today. But is it, are, there, are they things that you can actually predict or do they just happen by accident? You I can. Bought, I bought these and oh shit, they're worth £1,500 now. So the OGs are going to hate this. One of the things we're doing with the soul market, the soul market on the marketplace is giving sellers insights. So giving them a set of tools to be able to understand what products are selling well and what products aren't. Right. So to be able to predict what is good to buy and what is not. Um, so that's something that a lot of people have requested. Bearing in mind, by the way, before people say, oh, you're encouraging resale culture. No, there's a lot of that people. That really look, look people, down on. People say that, but there's a lot of people, a lot of sellers that sell products for below retail, below the price they bought them for. There's a lot of sellers that are selling them for retail because for whatever reason, they're getting them at a price just below retail. So a lot of the time, these resellers some of them aren't making a profit. A lot of them are not making a profit. Mm. There's certain products that are, but that is the law of supply and demand. Yeah. You can't hate that game. That is capitalism at its finest. Mm. It goes on in watches, tickets, food, sneakers, every single industry, yeah. uh, football kits, mm -hmm. everywhere. Supply and demand, simple. Yeah. Mm. Oh, you need to start doing boots. Boots, yeah. You, you into you your boots? boots yeah. I'm not really, but- I've got a are. couple pairs, man. Is it? I've got- Old school ones. Boot, football boots. I thought you meant like like boots, boots, like no, wearing no, out I'm boots. Talking about football. <laughs> no, I'm talking football boots. You know, like military boots to wear <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah. I thought that's what you're talking about. But <laughs> no, football no. boots. Football yeah, boots. yeah, yeah. We tried doing football boots, but as you know, it's different for you, right? But for someone that's like not your everyday footballer, they're buying a pair of boots maybe once a season. Yeah, that's true. So it's like a it's like a non-frequent purchase. Yeah. And there's a lot of effort to actually manage it on site. Yeah. But people are buying trainers once, twice a month, some of them. Mm. Like 60% of our audience are buying once or twice a month. Yeah. Wild. By the way, like mm. with all like the cost of living, everyone's struggling. Yeah. Do you see that within your business? People still obviously buying trainers like all the time. Mm. I'm thankful that last year we didn't have to change much. Mm. We just looked at costs slightly, but we didn't change anything. And we had a great Q4. We had a record breaking Q4. What do you mean you, you looked at costs? We looked at costs to make them a bit more efficient because we knew what was coming. Like certain services within the business, marketing spend, to try and reduce and them a little charge, bit. But you mean, what else do you charge for? No, I mean our, our costs as a business. Oh, uh, right, sorry. Yeah, right, just right, to try right. and reduce them a little bit. Got you. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean but, more for the customers. But we were affected by partnerships. There's certain partnerships that we don't have right now because the partnerships are trying to tighten up on costs. Mm. And the customers right now, Put it this way, if I was a customer, I'm happy, I say this on my Instagram, I'd be mo watching my money. I'd be minding my funds at the moment. Like yeah. I'd just be watching. I'd, I'd say if I was buying two pairs a month, I might be buying one pair a month. Mm. It's as simple as that. Like yeah. th the thing that is my mission right now after doing this stuff for eight years is sharing all the knowledge that I've got for finances, for business and everything else in the most authentic way. I'm not selling shit to mm -hmm. people. I just want you to get empowered to, to live your life better, 
yeah. to live well. And one of those things is finances. Mm. So if you're a 16 year old, you've got your part-time job and you're, you're, I don't know, you might not have that many costs, but you want to be smart with your funds. Buy your sneakers second. Look after your personal interests first, you know, developing yourself, paying your bills, saving some money or investing mm -hmm. some money and then buy sneakers. I've always said that. Yeah. And so that's like my general principle for living. Yeah. But, but so when we're talking about training for investment, mm. is that actually an option or is you not really advise that? It's very and risky. And reselling really frowned upon in, in that sneak industry. But it's frowned upon in every industry. If you get oh yeah, like tickets. And if the, you yeah. get yeah, if you get the tickets to say like I don't know like um, Adele concert and you resell them for two times money. Yeah, you know your friends that want to go to Adele are like, oh, are you selling? I want to go to Adele, and you've yeah. just done that, right? Because yeah, it's frowned upon, but there is money to be made. Mm. And if you're a 16 year old kid who's got some money, who's got some cash, what am I going to sit here to you and say if you've seen an opportunity to make? 50 or 100 pounds and you can get five pairs of those trainers don't do it because reselling is bad mm. don't put money on your parents table yeah. if you're struggling don't you know you might have a child at 17 18 mm -hmm. you know you might be one of those people you might need to fund your life like yeah you got to look after yourself and your people right mm -hmm. and sometimes reselling is an option for people and it's fine it's yeah. what happens this is the this is the world yeah. Yeah. In terms of investments, you mentioned there, do you do much outside of the sole supplier? I did a lot before, but don't dilute your interest. Yeah. If you've got a good focus that's working for you, you're learning and you're making money and it's working, don't dilute it. I used to try and invest in stocks, crypto, other such things, liquidated it all, and the money's all in on the business now. Mm. And back to that point of like not sacrificing the business for my personal. We break even every year. The revenue grows considerably, but we deliberately put everything back in. Right. And sometimes we'll make a deliberate loss if we need to spend some of the business cash mm. to grow, take us to the next level. Yeah. Um, so no, I don't do stuff like that anymore. I'll tell you, tell you a mad thing I did. I built an app for train refunds. After two years of running the sole supply, my mum was working at the time, still up London. She come to me and she said, George, we need to build a train refunds app. Or she said, have you got, can we build something for train refunds? Because she said, I'm trying to claim all these. And there's all these different websites. So like, this right. is the, the distraction I asked you about earlier. Yeah, the distraction. Yeah. So I went all in on this app. We probably spent 60 grand on it at the time. It wasn't a lot back then. People charging mad money for apps now. Yeah. Went, went in on this app and the amount of focus it took away from the sole supplier and Dan will tell you the same. I was doing a lot on that. I was trying to get Dan to do stuff for trains. He was making no money. Mm. It was eating money from the company. And we shut that down around a year, about a year after doing it. Yeah. Well, so so, you lost all the money, right? That you put in. Yeah, yeah, lost the money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it did make some money. But again, to, we were trying to take a cut of people's refunds. Yeah. And there were so many different things that were out of our control, right? And it just took so much time and money away. So when, when, I, when you ask like, do you invest in other things? If you've got something where you can see five opportunities and that's your main cash cow, look after that first. When that's completely run out of opportunities, then maybe look at other things. Mm. But I think it's very, um, it's very easy for us as entrepreneurs in that mindset to get distracted by other things. Yeah. and want to put multiple eggs in multiple baskets, but mm. focus is the thing that wins. Yeah, You know, when people say you go all in, Go all in on roulette. One number, it comes in, you win big. You never win big if you split your chips across all the different numbers. Yeah, yeah. But what mm. about things that require less of your time for just, so what are your thoughts on on like different streams of income? Having all your eggs in one basket and if everything did it go I think the world is so down. competitive now that especially if it's a digital business that you're not going to get the success you want unless you focus at it properly. Yeah. Our mind is like, it's like RAM in a computer or a hard drive. We've only got so much of it. And then you're, you're done for the day, right? Mm. We've not just got an unlimited hard drive in our head. So you yeah. need to put that time, that space to something where you can give it your all because there's someone out there that's focusing on it hundred percent. Mm. You know, I was lucky that at the time, some of our competitors weren't going at it like we were, but in business it, I'll give you an example of this, actually. I'm wrong. There was an example of someone that went at it more than we, we did. Mm -hmm. We built a marketplace five and a half, six years ago, just after Trains from Hell app. Spent over a hundred grand building this marketplace. By the way, at the time, I was so wild with risk. I probably spent like 
we probably had 130 in the bank and I basically spent all the money on the marketplace. I just used to, it was that mindset of it will all be okay. Yeah. I've got a lot more careful since it's more calculated, yeah. but then I'd just be wild with it. Spent this money. The marketplace started doing really well. I didn't know how to cope with the demand. I didn't know how to split my time. I didn't know how to manage people as well. We had to shut the marketplace down. StockX popped up one year later. Right. They've had half a billion investment and they're valued at over 3 billion. Mm. Do you know how much that hurt me at the time? Yeah. When I saw StockX blowing up. So yeah, there's that's that's a good example for you really, yeah. Is StockX literally do exactly the same StockX thing? StockX are a marketplace, but we yeah, shut yeah. our marketplace down and then not long after that. StockX didn't take the idea. Josh yeah, Luber, yeah, yeah. who was a great ideas man, probably had that bubbling for a while, mm -hmm. but it was just painful to see yeah. at the time. Um, so, but so right now, finance wise, all your income comes from just sole supplier. Sole supplier. No other, you don't do yeah. any property, you don't do any... Not really, no. Mm. No, I mean... I've got my property. We've got another one. We don't have any other investments. It's just all in on the sole yeah. supplier. Do you own property through the company, through sole supplier, earned, like offices and that? Earned through the company. Or how do you mean? I think as you own, does sole supplier own properties? No. No. No, sole supplier doesn't, no. Okay. So I got my property, earned that through the, through the yeah, business yeah, yeah. earnings over the years. And then we had a flat that we use another company for somewhere else. And that's it. Really, yeah. keep it very simple, man. So, and so all the offices you just lease? Offices are leased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our fourth office that I explained about, we, we we had a mortgage on and made good money on that. But when you want to buy an office in Shoreditch of, of, of good, you know, standing, it's going to cost you 2 million to get mm. a 2,000 square foot office. Yeah. You can't afford that. Why would you put 2 million into a property when your business needs cash? Your business will make you say, let's say a 10X return. Property will make you not even a 2X return. Yeah. Over a long time horizon, you might get a 2x return on property. But why would you do that when you've got a business? Business, your own business with your own idea is the best way to make money. Yeah. Right? And people have still have this dream of like property and investments. They're good. But if you've got a business, put it all into that. Mm. That's that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Because it's something that you do best. Yeah. And you know best. And 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 not a lot of people are going to be competing yeah. with you. And you've got more control over got it. Right? more control. Yeah, it's mm. a lot more growth opportunities. Yeah. Something like property or stocks, ultra competitive and the market is making it every day. Yeah. You've got to be so on the ball with all that stuff, man. Mm. Mm. Um, talk to me a little bit about working with brands. They're mm. tough. It's not now. What's your experience with, with it all? Well, <laughs> I'm going to use the power well, of- Working the bigger, the, see the big brands. The, the power of free yeah. again, like a good partnership's made up of- um, being a great, great relationships. Should have brought a triangle for you. A though. triangle. <laughs> <laughs> great relationships, over exceeding expectations, and it being fair is what I like to say. Mm. So we say like a partnership has to be fair. That's the definition of the word. And over exceeding expectations. In this industry, there's big brand money out there. You know, like let's say Reebok will come and they'll be like, you can, there's 200 grand budget. And companies will pitch back other publishers, let's say the hype beasts or the high snobs of this world. Mm. And they'll say, we're going to do this, this, and this. And they will deliver exactly that. Soul Supplier will offer more and deliver more. I'm not saying that other people don't do this. Yeah. It's always been my ethos. If we can deliver more without it costing us too much, over deliver on that. Mm. And that's how you sign long-term agreements, man. People are worrying too much about cost control. But trust me, in the long term, when you over deliver, it pays much more. It's intangible. You can't measure it, but in the long term, those partnerships are stronger and you get a rep that's like no other. Yeah. Mm. I like that. Okay, I've got a quick fire round for you. Go on. To wrap it up. Question one. How many trainees you got? <laughs> I got 200 pairs stolen out of a unit in Woolwich. Oh, shit. What, your personal ones? They were, the boxes were all still there. And the tra they were all stacked in the same position. They were all my OG pairs. The boxes were still there, but the trainers had gone okay. crazy. So my pairs were gone. So I just wear pairs now and I chuck them out or give them to charity. So I don't have a lot anymore. I probably got like 50 pairs and they're in rotation. Oh, they're just... all worn. They're all been on my feet. 
We've got some in the office, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not precious after that. It taught me a big lesson. <laughs> you know, the principle of stoicism. You yeah. posted on your story I today, no? Right, the yeah. Daily Stoic. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. mate. I saw that. I, I read that like three years. Bro, right. I wanted to confirm that with you, man. <laughs> so I saw that page. I was like, that's the Daily Stoic, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. it? Um, but that is like, don't be attached to that shit because it mm. can go. When, I, when that happened, I was like, I need to get my stuff into gear. I was sad about that. Yeah. But you, you can't. Yes, yeah, so I let go. Jeez. Yeah. So mm. you view about 200 pairs deep. Yeah, man. Yeah. Didn't get the insurance on it either because there's no signs of breaking and entering. So oh, you've had a few things. Big loss. In office, it? Big loss. How much reckon that um, that would have been worth? All them 200 pairs of trainers? 20 grand. Oh, that's tough. Man. Maybe more. Yeah. Average. There were some pairs that were worth like three, four hundred. In particular, if they, if they could just have to leave Mate, one there was pair. old like collaboration pairs, like Air Max 90s, Air Max 1s, some oh. of the rare Air Max 1s, Harachis, crazy stuff in there. It's a shame. You're making me think about it now. I'll be like, <laughs> oh, I'll sure I miss some of them. I haven't considered some of the actual shoes. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. that's getting attached to them again. But I yeah. do now, it's sentimental, some of them. I remember yeah, yeah. wearing them 10 years ago. If they yeah. had to leave one pair, if they just forgot to take one pair. It would be a weird Sean. pair called the Nike Sock Dart. Okay. Which was like know, a yeah. mad kind of like light material, really. Have a look at this sock right, dart. Cool. It's a sick shoe, man. Cool. Yeah. Um, give me two success hacks that have really worked for you. Um, set your intention every morning. Have a bulletproof routine that works for you. You can be dynamic with it and change it up. You don't have to do it every day, but you want to be able to set your, get yourself into the right state of mind to succeed every day. And when I say succeed, I mean put yourself in a place where you're productive, you're focused, and you've got good energy. Mm. And that might require some people exercising, some mm. people meditating, writing a few notes. Shouldn't be too long, yeah. but you should, because you sometimes wake up feeling shitty 100%. and you need to what get yourself. Mine, I, watched, I watched a little vlog that you did one time. Yeah, that was, that was a few years back. I don't do that stuff as much anymore because yeah. it takes too long. So mine, now, I just need to meditate and say a quick prayer or a quick affirmation. Yeah. Meditation in the morning for me with my 100 mile an hour brain lets me clock my thoughts more and gets me focused. Mm. And then exercise, pivotal. I'm running, yeah. I'm gymming, but not always in the morning. The yeah. point is, if you get that in your day, your, the rest of your days will be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. What's been uh, your lowest moment in business? Um, when we had to walk away from the JD Sports Partnership, the day that they phoned us up and they said that they couldn't agree to the deal. Yeah, I say this openly now. I used why? to hide these names. It, it was some wild reason why they couldn't agree to the deal. I thought the business was going to fall apart. I was living at home still at the time. I remember walking into my mum and saying, Mum, sole supply is going to fail. I'd left my job at the time and it was a horrible moment. The my stomach dropped of like everything went out like I was like it was like a painful feeling what would you like financially really dependent on that deal it was a big it was a big retailer at the time it made us most of our money they didn't know that at the time <laughs> <laughs> so when that happened they really screwed us over and it, I, yeah I lost I lost my mind so it, the uh, whole partnership in general no work was in whatsoever exactly yeah why, why, why but we la it? it turned around later and we agreed some slightly different terms right. and you start to learn this across breadth of experience in business these things happen you mm. have to learn to deal with them you can't lose your head and your stomach every day because yeah. then you f lose your focus completely mm. yeah that was horrible though yeah mm. the highest moment in business that way, that moment where you sat there and said, wow, we, we, we've got here, we've done it. There's oh, moments where I go into the office that I'm in now and I turn on the lights in the morning and I'm just like, I'm walking into this office today. I know who's coming in. I switch on the lights. I see this neon sign and I'm like, this is where we've got to from sitting in my parents' spare bedroom to mm. now we're in Shoreditch with 45 odd people yeah. and they're good people that I like, right? So that's like an ongoing bit of like high. Yeah. But one moment, I really can't give you one moment, mm. man. I like that's a good thing, bro. Yeah. It's like that. It's, it's. I thought that every day is kind of a high, right? Yeah. Like if you have this, have this kind of mindset of there's so many things to be grateful for when mm. you wake up. Not just material, not just your business. Yeah. The fact that you are able-bodied and you can train and you can live good. I love training, man. Mm. I love the fact that I can get up and be fucking healthy and, and train. Yeah. And then go into an office where I like people I work with, which I never had. It's like, 
I'm thankful. So that all the success and the rest of it's a bonus. Sounds like a cliche, so, bit of a bit of a cheesy answer. Yeah, no, but, I hear it. But I live that. It's it's true, mm. and the people around me will say the same. Yeah, nice. Mm. What's the uh, what's the most expensive trainer you've seen been bought? I bought the Cause Jordan Four, which not is a, you though. It's what you've seen been bought. But I'd like to hear that as well. Um, yeah, so my personal one was the Cause Jordan Four. I paid a thousand pound for it. It's now worth three grand. You still got it? That was an accident. I didn't do it for that reason. I just wanted it. Still right. got it. And that's, that's yeah, that's my most valuable shoe. But the so most expensive the pair I've seen, I've seen is the Nike Mag, the original Nike Mag from Back to the Future. That's pretty cool. I've worn that, you know, I've actually, you know, put my foot in it. Like they recreated it and that was cool. There was like 50 pairs. So the Nike Mag's probably worth like 100 grand. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Any trainer that comes out, can you pretty much get it? For anyone listening, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get any trainers. Well, but I, I like generally, that. if I'm close with someone, you know, you're in my circle, I say we can get most pairs. If you ask me, I can ask our retailers and mm. we can reserve them. I can't get them after release. Yeah. This is like someone saying, can you get a Nike stock after it's on the open market? No, mm. I can only get... Like really, what about really old pair of trainers? Like Nike no, brought out a then, trainer. No, because then it's on the open market and people are reselling it for, yeah. for money, right? So Nike so, don't keep their old, old trainers at all, do they? I can't get them. It's stuff that's coming I can get. Because otherwise right, it's just right, me right. and you are going to pay the same price. Why yeah, would a yeah. reseller that's got a shoe worth 400 pound give it to me just because I'm... Yeah. Well, I just they feel might, like, but it'd be... I, feel like, I feel like Nike, yeah, when they bring out like trainers from back, back in the day, sick ones, they should just always have a stash they do have a stash in oh, their do, archives yeah. they do have an archive and so we've seen get, some you, of them but i can't get them they won't right, get them. Oh, this is like this is like gold boy, dust you, you tight. <laughs> um cool no bro they, they don't they don't even give us some of the new releases love you nike but you don't give us some of Why? them right? if, you, if, you, if you get so much okay. um sales for them Hey, can you imagine the amount of millions we're driving for Nike and still they don't give us some of the new releases <laughs> and still like they're, they're, they're tight with footballers, uh, artists and other people. Yeah. They don't like, it's very rare, especially Nike. They want to control this because they don't want people to be, they don't want it to be unfair. Mm. Why would I get 10 pairs when like average dude on the street can't get 10 pairs, right? I'm, no spe I'm not special and neither is that person on the street. We're just on the same. So it's got to be fair. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's just that's not fair yeah, for the people. I hear that. Yeah, he drives more sales for Nike. You are uh, Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Ser How many sales what? does he drive? I don't know. Do you know? No. It's got to be Ronaldo, isn't it? I'd like I to. I like to be uh, optimistic and say yeah. it was me. <laughs> but but if you think like I don't know in financial terms that we we could maybe drive it's not like, that far off though. You'd think you just straight away say Ronaldo, right? Do you think Ronaldo drives Nike more than 25 million a year? That's what I'm saying. In sales, probably. He's got 100 million followers on his Instagram. I reckon he drives them way more than 25 a year. What's his contract worth? 25. What's the, is his contract with Nike <laughs> worth? Yeah, yeah. well, for, <laughs> I reckon they're getting a good return on them. Do you know what? I don't know. That's a complex topic, mm. that. Are they getting a return on their money? They probably don't even care either, do they? Yeah, because it does so many intangible things yeah, that they can't exactly. measure. Yeah. It's one of them again. It's Brand like, awareness, like yeah, by having him on, there's so many things that happen that they don't even realize yeah. that he would be scared to get rid of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the same principle as like treating people well. Watch what it comes back in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you you just get these intangible benefits. You can't measure them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like a just like a feeling, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's just you see little things happen, and then you're yeah. like. That must be a result of of that. Yeah. Mm. Um, scenario, yeah. So you've got to start a fresh business. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with trainers whatsoever. Okay. I spin a wheel. It'd be a random business. I stop on a random business. You can't control it. Choose one business partner. Yeah. And you've got to take this company to a billion. Anyone in the world. <sighs> Who are you choosing? <sighs> You're thinking deep here. That's tough. One business partner. Yeah. Oh, man, I love my senior team to bits. Like, I cannot choose one of them. No, no, no. I'm talking anyone. I know anyone, but I've just thought of no. them immediately. Oh, did you? As in like... Anyone in the world. As in, so you have to know someone and trust them well to go into no, business no, 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 with no. them. That's the first oh, thing. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. So yeah. for me to choose someone in the world is a very tough thing because it goes deeper than just what you see on the surface. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So that's a tough question. But you've got no other choice. But to just I've got pick. no other choice. Who would I go into business with right now? 
Someone I've really liked as of recent is Patrick Bet David. Yeah, he's a G. I like him. He is a smart businessman. He's humble and he's got something about him. Mm. And he's he's got fucking bags. Oh, I'm swearing, but well, you're gonna have to bleep that out. <laughs> no, he'd be swearing the camera. He's got bags of integrity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I love. He's an ideas man, he's confident, integrity, mm. family man. What does he actually do? I think he came up in the financial industry. Okay, cool. Um, and then he started his podcast after. Yeah, he's made so a lot he's, of content. He's he? been very successful before as well. So yeah. like the clout came second. It's a tough question, that man. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I hadn't had, had that prepared. <laughs> <laughs> what but about I, you? I think that right now, Yeah. Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. Yeah. Yeah, that's a controversial one. It is, yeah. I think he is a great businessman because... He is good at communicating, down, like one of the, the best communicators. Mm. That's not just why he's good at business. And he seems like a man of integrity. But with what's gone on recently, you just don't know, right? As in, it looks like there could be some degree of targeted attack. Mm -hmm. But it also looks like, like, like you don't know. There's so many different allegations mounting up. Yeah. And this is one thing on this, right? If you've been following the stuff that's been going on with Andrew Tate or people getting cancelled, the system is designed to confuse you. What, what, what goes on, which stops people from succeeding is they put out so much information, you don't know what to believe. You just sit on the fence. You just sit or on the fence. Or you go back to what you're used to. Yeah. So everyone, whether you like Andrew Tate or not, um, then you just don't know what to believe. The allegations true. Are they not? But I think, I think these are for the, that's mainly a problem for people that can't think for themselves. To some degree, but the actual, the, the machine it works in this way now. Like during COVID... And still to this day, there are still so many things that we don't quite know the true facts on. Yeah. In terms of the scientific studies, there's so many things going on now where there's there's science behind it. People still don't know what to believe. Mm. We are in a world now where it's just designed to confuse. I am convinced. So my theory, my way of dealing with it is to turn everything off. Mm. Stop looking at the news. Stop looking at socials. Yeah. If you're going to use socials, put out good content for the world that's valuable. And if you're going to look at the news, do it very targeted, take what you need from it and switch it off. Mm -hmm. But don't be mindlessly consuming information all day. Don't be mindlessly following stuff Yeah. because it's dangerous for the mind. You will not achieve what you want when you do that. Facts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Love that. Last one. What's your core philosophy of life and entrepreneurship? Integrity is the big one. I think if you have integrity in business, you will... You will form a lot of partnerships easily mm -hmm. you will build a good culture naturally and it will be so much more enjoyable if you've got good integrity that means that means being a strong character but also being able to have humility to admit when you're wrong right integrity is number one for my business philosophy and i try and bring people on around me that have that and the other part in life <laughs> that could be the same yeah in it's life. the same it's internet um yeah. In life, you've got to try and go after the best version of yourself every day. Yeah. Every day is a new day to try and conquer that day. Every little thing you do each day is an opportunity to take to take the right decision for yourself. Every little moment, you've got a decision, whether I eat that, whether I do that, whether I hang with this person, whether I handle that situation in the right way. So don't see it as like, I'm going to start this next week. You've got an opportunity later that day to do something yeah. good or something bad. And I've spent a lot of time doing a lot of the wrong things. So I know how important that is. So it's like, yeah, trying to get up every day with that fresh mindset, set your intention and be the best of yourself. Because then everything else comes easier when you're, when you're living your best. Mm -hmm. It's not always perfect though. So don't get it twisted. Yeah. Bro, I love that. That was sick. Appreciate it. Hey. Hey, that works as well, bro. That works as well. Love, love that. that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Kevin.